First of all, thank you very much all for joining us today. Our subject, the meta subject is called Transition on the Margins. And the impetus pretty much comes from my observations that we do an excellent job of talking to the 1% who are already con convinced that we're doing the right thing but we do not do the best of jobs in talking to the 99%, and I'm exaggerating a little bit, but perhaps only slightly, talking to the 99% of those people who do not feel like they're being spoken to. And I am extremely fortunate to have a group of individuals who do exactly that. They go out of their way to sp speak to those people who perhaps are not only always considered to be part of the scenery, and our subject specifically will be tied to urban gardening and those people on the margins. Rolling and I'm going to get out of the way. I'm going to hand it over to Bistra, who will ex uh, say a little bit about herself, about her organization. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Bistra, and I'm from Sofia, from uh, Bulgaria. I'm the co-founder and chairperson of a Bulgarian NGO called Multicuti Collective, which has been working in the field of migrant integration for 13 years now. Um, from one side, we do grassroots activities connected to uh, culture, food, art, urban gardening, and other topics. But we also do a more serious research. Um, we are monitoring the integration policies in Bulgaria. We do high-level uh, advocacy. We, we work with the media. So with the left and the right foot, we try to uh, foster the integration of migrants uh, through various channels. And... Um, um, for our uh, multi-quality garden, uh, it was uh, a small experiment which turned out to be uh, very successful. Mm -hmm. But I guess that you're going to speak uh, um, later about it. So uh, now I'm going to uh, pass the floor to Helen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, so from Bulgaria, we come, we come to Norway. My name is Helen Gallis. I work in Fragment in Oslo. Uh, and I've been working for the last, I think, 12 years with urban gardening in many different respects. But the gardening itself was never the objective. It was more the tool uh, because it's a, it's just a great way to to bring people together and get conversations starting. And you know, when you start talking with each other in a garden about plants, you eventually start talking about the bigger things. Like um, you talk about the weather, if it's sunny or if it's dry, or if it's been raining more than usual. So the the journey from being in a community garden and talking about climate is much shorter than in many other sort of areas of life. Uh, so I've been involved in, in facilitating quite a lot of different community gardens. Um, and more than being directly aimed at immigrants, it's more been aimed at facilitating that, that space where immigrants and non-immigrants actually meet uh, and we've also learned uh, that it's a great uh, leveler because in uh, many times in a community garden we see that the immigrant has the high knowledge and the norwegian needs to learn from the immigrant so that's it's just uh, it's just a very good tool to sort of balance the egos of the know it all local when they have to come to the immigrant and ask for help and support and the immigrant can be the resourceful and knowledgeable person that helps to ensure everybody's success so it's just it's just a really really effective uh, um, public space for integration and getting conversations started and it's not easy to get conversations started in Norway. we're you know we us nordics we're used we're, we're known for being quite restricted uh but when we have something to talk about it's just much easier for us so you know we can point point at a plant and say look a tomato and then that's you know that's those tiny tricks that can get a conversation started so um yeah so facilitating very different uh community garden spaces uh and bringing the margins to the center i think would be summing up what we do and it's also quite similar to, i mean cordula well, i'll hand it over to you next but you you do it at a much bigger scale uh, on a national scale so cordula take it away yeah, thanks for the invitation and for sharing our experiences here. I'm from Austria, I'm based in Vienna, and we are the Association Gartenprolog. My colleague Susie is also here. And um, yeah, our association was founded with the idea to um, foster intercultural community gardens. 
And we also copied, it was, it was not a new idea, we copied that from Germany and from other initiatives in other countries. So there is a lot of networking going on and a lot of exchange going on and learning from each other already before getting started. But then we came to Vienna with this idea and it was rather new here, like in, back in 2007. And it needed a lot of convincing municipalities to say, yes, people can do that. People can garden together, organize gardens together. And we always had this idea that there are different people with different backgrounds, not necessarily migrants, but also people with different social backgrounds, people with different um, language skills, people with different abilities can come together in a garden and have a shared topic. And through this shared topic, as you said, Helen, it's much easier to come together and it's much easier to get in touch, even if you would never get in touch, if you just meet on the street or if you just live side by side because you do not share anything. And you wouldn't go to this person and say, oh, hello, how are you? What are you doing? What is your experience about the salad or the peas? So it's much easier to get in touch. And it's, yeah, I think really, great place where you can learn how to do things together, how to organize together. And it's not a matter of where you are from, but it's much more a matter of you're interested in this common topic and you want to share something and you want to do something together. And I think that's something that we really need in society, that different people come together and have a shared goal, whatever it is and try to find a good solution without thinking about what is your pre preference in political parties, what is your preference in, I don't know, cars and <laughs> other stuff. So yeah, from our experience, it's really a great tool to bring different people together. Uh, yeah, I, I have a question. I'd leave it open to all of you, whoever would like to take it at first, feel empowered that what I heard in, in that of what you were mentioning is quite interesting that the, it was a, a way to start a conversation. I heard that numerous times. And the conversation might be pretty simple, but it got things started. And so when we look at this project of urban gardening as a means by which you bring people together, that means that the possibilities are actually they're they're endless if you really think about it. So perhaps if you have any suggest um, any stories that you'd like to tell, some um, highlights, so to speak, of those initiatives that you've had over the years that grew into something much bigger than just talking about the salad or the peas. Maybe I can share you our uh, experience uh, from Sofia because I was involved in the project in the very early stage uh, when um, uh, we had to actually build the space because it was an abandoned yard, etc. And we wanted to invite uh, uh, migrants, refugees from different countries, also the locals, etc., etc. What I think worked very well is that we collaborated with some uh, other NGOs who are in more closer touch with uh, refugees in particular. Because um, I think it really helped to um, break the ice and to make them feel welcome because there was a connection between us. Um, the uh, refugees that we work with, they're from Afghanistan, from Iraq, from Syria. For them, this urban gardening doesn't sound very familiar as a practice from their own countries of origin. So having such so, sort of a mediation in between was uh, uh, very helpful. And when we started building everything, we dedicated a few separate sessions on how do we want to do it together? How are we going to organize the space? What kind of things we want to plan for the future? What kind of materials have we have to buy together? So having everybody involved from the very, very beginning, I think that was a very powerful tool to uh, help them have ownership of this project. They're, they didn't feel like just guests, but it, they, they were able to give ideas and uh, what to do, et cetera. And because we are an, an NGO, we're always short on budget. We upcycled a lot. We had to find some stuff and some old pots and some old stones and whatever. So everybody was really uh, helping with that. And um, I also noticed that um, some people felt shy that they couldn't contribute with much. But for example, they had seeds. 
And this is actually such a valuable thing that you can offer, right? So uh, it was really nice to also show that whatever your contribution is, it's never too small. And from a seed, uh, a big plant uh, can grow, and it can give fruits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that was uh, uh, really nice in, in in terms of starting uh, together and uh, planning. If I can give a more uh, much more abstract example, uh, we had um, a youth program going over several years where we. Uh, employed local teenagers in small garden teams and they had a mentor that would show them so it would be a, a nice way to get your first job experience. Uh, we collaborated with a local high school that has the highest dropout rate uh, in the country, I think. And most of the students have uh, have an immigrant background. Um, and many of either first or second generation background. Um, so uh, as we were doing different uh, compost projects, one of the interesting feedbacks that we got from some of the girls was that I finally now understand what sustainability means because we have we've learned about it in school and we had to memorize some sort of scheme with there was a cloud and there was rain it was like all connected it didn't make any sense but now it finally makes sense to me so I think as as a as a hands-on practical arena to translate like abstract uh school subjects into something that you can feel and touch uh has has a very high value it's it's i'm not sure like the imp i mean the impact on this was on few people but it really widened their understanding so it was sort of on two very different like individual scale but wide impact on their whole on their own no knowledge scale um and it's i love telling that story now so it's also it also has an impact in that way. Um, and a very reverse kind of scale. Another story that I like telling is about uh, a young Afghan boy that was uh, a volunteer in one of our projects. Um, and for him, it was really rewarding to be cultivating tomatoes in the middle of the city because he knew that in a country far, far away on the other side of the planet, his family was doing the same thing. So by by working in the garden and cultivating tomatoes, he could kind of be together with his family that he missed so much. So it also says something about like the infinite sort of uh, interconnectivity of our planet and how how this is something we have in common everywhere. And we can be together even if we're apart through something as simple as being in a garden. Yeah, I think it's it's really good point, like what, what it does with people with children, we like Susie and I just come from our educational garden where we had a workshop this morning. And then you find all those children who like we're in a very, very diverse district, which like low income district with this educational garden and their schools are around who come to this garden. And then you work with those children together. And then there are many of them who tell you, well, I've never eaten a carrot out of the so directly out of the soil or, I, or I've never touched um, um an earthworm and like last week we had a child who came to the garden and said oh i'm so afraid of earthworms i'm so afraid of earthworms one hour later he had the earthworm in his hand and carried it around and was very very proud of being able to do that or yeah just doing it and i think of course this, those are just few people but those are the children who grow up to become adults and if you do not work with them they will never get in touch with nature. And I think getting in touch with nature as a child, even in a city, even in a very dense district with low possibilities, it's a really important contribution. And community gardens can also do a lot in this sense, involving children. Um, going in reverse, uh, I also hear that a lot of people that I admire that are, they can be writers or musicians or artists or but they have stories like that from their childhood. So because someone, because they had the opportunity to to hold an earthworm in their hand, that has impacted who they have become as adults. So so I th I think the the impact is you know we have um, free thinking people that uh, are connected to 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 the earth as an ecosystem, and that are implement you know that are their teachers, their chefs, their artists they're they're architects but because they had the earthworm experience when they were kids 
that shapes who they, what kind of architect they have become, what kind of chef they have become, what kind of teacher they have become. So the impact is also uh, like it's it's rings in the water, you know. It's a small impact, but it can really cha change uh, a person and a community uh, on a wider scale. But yeah, sorry, Michael, back to you. Oh, as as I mentioned, the 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 less I have to say, the better off we are. I just, uh, was was thinking about something, Beast, that you were talking about. That story that I hear quite often is that we are learning more from the newcomers about those things that actually are quite innate in us. The those things that we should really know, those natural things, and because we are so estranged from the natural environment that we don't even know where to start. Whereas individuals who are not necessarily coming from this Western culture, uh, all of this is quite natural. And so I'd, I'd be curious that the, especially if, if our goal is to do more with less, I thought Beaster, what you were talking about was very interesting because uh, you you were compelled to be inventive because you were lacking of something that being primarily funds. So I'd be curious to hear from from all of you what kind of experience you've had in in doing reverse um, reverse learning, learning from those newcomers about things that actually we should already know. That's Whoever a very good like question. Together. Yeah, that's a good. Uh, that's a, a great question. Maybe now it's the moment to also mention that um, our, our uh, urban garden was uh, located in um, in a venue that we um, rented for the primarily uh, purpose of a cooking school. Uh, also, some lectures, some festivals, etc. But the main thing that, that that we had was a big kitchen with uh, professional equipment, etc. So the main goal of this uh, space was to hold cooking classes and to learn from from each other how to cook. But from the very beginning, we wanted to be as sustainable uh, as possible. So uh, actually, that's why we decided to make this urban garden, because we figured out that we have so much food waste or uh, um, uh, peels of the carrots, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that we wanted to do something with it and to put it in the compost and then to start the whole process. And also the idea was to also plant and to grow some herbs and spices that are difficult to be found in Bulgaria. Sometimes they could be very expensive or they could be, come in a, in a bad shape from God knows where, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So in this way, we wanted to do this um, two-way um, connection between the kitchen and the garden. Because uh, often the contemporary Western person, of course, goes to the supermarket to buy um, the produce, the, the food and the vegetables and the fruits. And uh, I, th I think still a little percent um, are still connected um, to um, to a bigger level to the to the farms to the um, could be uh, in in different uh, food cooperatives uh, or um, urban gardens or um, mm, solidarity farming initiatives etc uh, etc et but still it's a smaller percent I think like the the supermarkets really took over and now we are the alternative uh, minority which is trying to raise awareness that this used to be normal. 50 uh, years ago and uh, now um, we have to fight uh, to win it back so uh, just on the topic of um, mutual exchange i think that for us it was very interesting that uh, to see actually how many migrants really brought their their seeds and their plants from their home country and if they go for example to uh, iran once every three years because um, they can't afford to go uh, as often as they would like to like every year but they would always make sure to stuff their suitcase with the uh, food with ingredients with some spices because this really brings them the feeling of home and um, uh, it was also nice that they wanted to share these seeds and to share these plants so that we can grow it together as a community so whenever they would host a cooking class let's say in in persian cuisine they would have the the right spices and they would be like ha ah, this comes from our garden so this also brings a little bit of a sense of pride it also goes back to telling your mom in uh, iran that uh, you're going to host a cooking class but uh, the herbs are coming you know we have it from our garden so um, I think that this is also interesting because uh, this, it, it also helped um, introduce the local population, so the Bulgarians, 
who are unaware about these herbs and spices and some small plants etc we just don't have it it's, it's impossible to to find it but they can be very tasty and they can bring the cuisine to a whole new, uh, a different level so uh, that was also nice to combine the cooking uh, with with a garden thanks Yeah, I think there's a like in almost every community garden, there's a lot of knowledge sharing in all directions. And we, for example, we have one garden in Austria, they have introduced those guided tours through the garden. And so all the different gardeners share their knowledge about the garden and about their special um, practices in their bed. So they tell each other what they grow, why they grow it, where it comes from. And try, yeah, just try to to introduce these different practices in in the collective work so that's also something you could you could do and i mean there are a lot of abilities that gardeners bring in and we know like from the garden the begegnung which is in in the south of vienna which is close to a huge refugee home the people from there they brought a lot of knowledge in carpentry in sewing stuff and and they develop their like this they call it global talents um workshop where people could bring in their expertise and share it with others to to do also crafts and different stuff which and all the people came together through the garden i think uh if i want to add another example i think going beyond immigrants as like marginal or um, marginalized residents we had um, one in very interesting project a few years ago um, uh, of establishing a, a community garden in a very, very rough downtown space, which is quite dominated by, by drug use and drug sellers. Uh, and the municipality, they, they really, they were actually explicit about, they wanted us to find a way to get rid of the the roma people that were there and the drug users that were there and we had to keep i had to keep telling them that you know i'm not a social worker i'm not a police i do not have the power or the interest to get rid of anyone however we can bring more people in uh, and we can communicate with the people that are already there so instead of talking about and and talking to people we're talking with them uh, and we had this uh, we set up the garden over it's it's an um, asphalt covered space so it, we had to uh, put in planter boxes we had the setting up was over a long weekend and i had explicitly told every team member that we have lots of food here so make sure you go we go up to and speak to absolutely everyone who's coming through this space no matter what your background you can no matter if you look like you have money or no money if you're smelly if you're high on whatever drugs uh doesn't matter but if you're not comfortable with going up and approaching absolutely every kind of person that goes here i'm sorry but you can't be a part of the team this weekend because that is at the core so doing it this way and really talking with people and engaging people into anything from like carrying bags of soil etc uh, we got the drug hold, the drug dealers as stakeholders and placekeepers, so they were quite involved in the whole thing. And and you know, uh, some of them would come up to us and say that um, you know I'm I'm doing the the drug therapy now, so I'm not taking drugs, but I'm still hanging out in the area here, and I know the people, so I will keep an eye on this space for you. Don't worry. Uh, we had other people that told us later that or that we heard through other people that this had been the first time that they had ever actually been actively included in a social dynamic so they had actively been invited in and they had contributed in a meaningful way and that is what it is to be a community that is what it is, is to be a society it is to 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 be able to contribute and to have a scenario where anyone's contribution whether it's you know five seeds or being a strong big guy that can carry huge bags of soil it's all parts of the same of the same puzzle and interestingly over the summer of that season we had um the police had lots of they, they had a log every day of uh, of activities in the area 
and we got we got to see the log at the end of the season and you can see up until the day we established it there were uh, sort of disturbances or negative loggings of uh, muggings or filth or um, uh, crime happening or drug dealings being spotted or whatever and from the day the project was set up until unfortunately it was closed in October because we had elections in September and the party that had ordered this lost power. So in, within those, those months, there was not a single negative incident registered. So it actually worked. And then two or three years later, the municipality wanted to implement the same thing. They're like, whoa, that, that thing actually worked. They didn't do the groundwork. They didn't insist on bringing people in. They just, you know, sent some municipal workers in and threw in some planter boxes and expected people to treat them nicely. And it was a disaster. And then they tried to ameliorate, to fix it by creating um, jobs around it for, for teenagers, like summer jobs. But you can't really put uh, young, unexperienced teenagers in such a rough area and expect them to be the sort of guardians of that sort of space when it's when the process did not include or involve the actual users at all so um so it's definitely possible to use it in a positive way to include many different communities on the margins uh and um uh, in another community garden that i started 10 years ago um he was also in a space that was frequented by quite a lot of uh drug dealers we spoke to them and said look we're not social workers. We're not the police. You do your thing. I have that's not my my issue at all. But if you don't mind, can you move just a few feet down the road in the afternoon between like say four and seven, so the kids can have a nice place to hang out? And these were you know the people de dealing drugs. They're not old themselves. They're maybe eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty you know, they have younger siblings. They know that they don't want their kids, their siblings to hang out in this area. They're fine with that because we spoke to them or with them and we came to that joint agreement. And the best part of it, the absolute best story about that is that uh one morning uh one of the young girls in the neighborhood calls me and she's devastated. She says, you know, you have to come over. The garden is broken. Someone broke our garden. And we had had so many cherry tomatoes. We gotten the ones with tons and tons and tons of small tomatoes on them. And someone had broken them and pulled up several of them. This, this was maybe like 20 garden boxes in a small green space in a very dense urban area. So we started fixing. It was like, no, no, don't worry. You know, there's still plenty of tomatoes left and uh, don't worry, it's gonna be okay. And then one of the drug dealers comes by and I ask him, did you see anything? Have, have you seen anything like, I, we don't know when it happened sometime last night. And then this dealer said, and it just looked at me and it's like, I saw it. I made sure that this will never happen again. <laughs> so it's like, don't worry, Helena, this person will never come back here. So when this, like, you know, I I hate it, but I love it. But it's just the fact that the street justice could be on the side of a public space with public tomatoes for everyone to enjoy. If you bring in people, if you talk with people, if you have the conversation that everyone's part of the community. Um, again, that project was taken over by the municipality and then they just, they were never there and they never talked with people. So that project also fell apart within a couple of years and now it's back to all dealing and no fun um but bringing in and talking with people i think is the magic pill that solves pretty much everything wow i'm so impressed by helena's uh, stories really really amazing work good job to you and the whole team <laughs> fantastic uh, something that you said made me think about um how do we translate our experience into some sort of a best practice or something to learn from like transfer of knowledge what you said about the the change in the like uh, after the election the party that supported you lost etc so i wonder like how come that uh, 
somebody ha has to uh, invent the wheel and to start doing wrong strategies uh, and to try this and that when things were already working um uh, to me, it's really a big question because in Sofia, for example, we did tremendous amount of work to try to engage the municipality, but we couldn't. Like there was so much work being done in in in, in terms of finding um, potential plots of land, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But all the urban gardens that are uh, existing in Sofia are still private. They they are either uh, in some private uh, yard or or private space or public, but the gardens have to pay. So the municipality does not offer it uh, 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 for free. So um, I just wanted to ask you, like, how do you communicate these good practices um, between cities? Because maybe um, um, the colleagues here, uh, Suzanne and um, Korlula, I'm not sure if I pronounce uh, your name, sorry, um, uh, correctly. So how 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 can you inspire others and really communicate what works and what doesn't, so that we don't start all over again? I think Cordula is the right person to do this because you've really worked on the networking and spreading the knowledge, right? Yeah, I think what is really important is to show people that it works somewhere else. And for example, when we started in Vienna, I, I was not yet part of the team, but we took our um, director of, of gardening, like of the green um, department to Paris to show him <laughs> what works there and it's i think there's always a competition between cities so if you tell someone look over there it works already and it works quite well it doesn't have to be that it will be the same in our city like for example here the gardens also have to pay a small fee and it's yeah not everything works that well and we, we still like a strategy for urban gardening but still it gave them somehow an impression okay it's good to do it it can work and someone can yeah someone can do it and people can do it and that's how we got people convinced and we, we're doing a lot of networking like we're we have established the um the austrian network of community gardens and right from the beginning it was a lot of learning from each other as well so there were gardens from different parts of austria meeting sharing strategies talking to each other telling what works what doesn't work and i think that's really important because especially in the beginning beginning the initiatives felt very alone like they thought well we're the first in our city to do something new we don't know how to start we don't know what works what doesn't work and this exchange is really really valuable and also to convince people it's very important to have international best practices and that's what we also did like last year we invited people from different cities like from berlin from rotterdam to a conference in vienna to share their experience and to tell about what they're doing in their cities and i think it helped us a lot to get in touch with the municipality again and today i'd like to introduce michelle who's call calling in from toronto Perhaps, Michelle, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing in Toronto, and then we'll bring you into the general conversation. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. So as you said, I'm, I'm Michelle, and uh, I live in a high-rise community uh, very close to downtown Toronto, uh, which, of course, is our, our biggest city here in Canada. Um, so my community uh, doesn't have a lot of green space and it's known to be a low income uh, a landing community, as you would say. Uh, we have a lot of immigrants that arrive in this, this particular community. We're also known for um, to have the highest number of children in in any community across uh toronto which then really across canada are we have two elementary schools here one is one school is just for uh, a jk and sk so just kindergarten there are 600 students that go to that school um so we have the biggest elementary schools across north america so it's a very unique community that we have here um so as a resident, I, I wanted to live a, a little more of an eco-friendly lifestyle and growing food was, of course, on, you know, uh, on my agenda. Of course, the community gardens here uh, are very limited and very hard to get into. So I just thought I will, you know, kind of create my own. 
So I now have been doing this for 10 years. I have uh, a not-for-profit organization that we call Thorncliffe Park Urban Farmers. And uh, we have two communal gardens. Um, I say communal because they're not allocated spaces. It is a community effort. Um, so they're about a quarter acre each in size. And then we planted about 25 fruit trees across nine different buildings. So that's me. <laughs> Thank you for having me today. I think what has been a challenge in the projects that got off to a really good start and really inclusive has been that there hasn't been the budgeting to allow for the social function to be developed uh, because it's when you're when there's funding opportunities you can usually get the funding to build the beds to for the plants for the shovels for the, sort of the infrastructure of it because that's very easily understood by the municipality that that falls into easy to understand categories but the role of hanging out and, and sweet talking with the local drug dealer so that he takes care of the space that is really difficult to put into uh, into uh, sort of an item in the budget. Uh, and I think also, I think part of my experience with that has to do with that. This is considered a sort of a, a, a typology of a park. So it's governed by the parks uh, department in the city. And they're used to thinking very sort of, they're used to thinking very abst or very, itemized about what what is a park it, it's the number of garden beds it's the number of trees the number of park benches and they're not really concerned about the social aspect the educational potential the integration that has nothing to do with their responsibility uh so their their funding also difficult it's difficult for these fundings to open up for responsibilities that are far outside of the scope of parks uh, and I think that's that's a challenge within sort of city administration structures, is that they're not able to to see across departments and see that. I mean, sometimes we've gotten funding that has been really in the right place. Like we got some funding from the Directorate of Health because uh, I found in some statistics that a local community garden was located in an area where the mental health was really they were scored really badly on mental health. So I could use mental health as an argument to build a community garden, that this is a meeting place, this, this can, uh, you know, there's too much, uh, too many single person households in this area. There's too much loneliness. People need places to meet where there's a low threshold to just go there and join some activity because that will improve the public health and the mental health of that area. But those funding opportunities are very rare. And I think that also comes back to what Vistra mentioned that funding is critical it's it's the difference of of making it making by with the bare minimum or being able to do something you know even better and nicer uh, which i'm not saying that money can buy happiness but it can surely solve a few problems also in terms of the respect of the work that a community garden coordinator does that is that should be that's um that's a green job just as important as installing solar panels you know being a community builder being a, a garden facilitator that there's no reason why that salary shouldn't be equivalent to the salary of a teacher so uh but somehow you know it's uh, city administrations tend to expect that we uh that we love this so much that we work for free I can only second that. Uh, I I completely agree, and this is why actually some projects really uh, fall apart, especially when using also private space. Because for example, we had to close our garden because we had to get out of this uh, venue, which and then we, we we couldn't move to somewhere else because we 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 didn't have the the means to uh, rebuild it. Uh, but in any case, I wanted to bring another aspect of um, uh, from one side speaking to the. I don't know how Michael put it, uh, the 99% the, the uh, who are not uh, I'm sure that, that you're doing the great job and also the, the aspect of finance. So we can uh, combine these two and I can give uh, one example from our work. Um, 
very early on we got um, um, a call from uh, a company which uh, was following us on the social media and was just interested to do a team building for their workers. Not only that, but they were also ready to uh, sponsor the garden with uh, buying some materials, buying some stuff that we needed. So we were able to send them a list of uh, things. So then the company was able to, um, to buy these things. And then the employees had one full day of uh, getting dirty, uh, working together, uh, you know, uh, they just did whatever uh, was needed uh, at that moment. And I think that the feedback was also very interesting because these were people who do not ne necessarily care about migrants or gardening. You know, it was their free day from work that they didn't have to sit in the office, but they had to do something else. And um, uh, it was very nice because it also uh, made them realize um, that, that what, what, what they're speaking about, these things uh, at the margin, uh, the margin of society where they don't go to, but suddenly they, they became part of it. And also really on the community building level, it turned out that some of the um, colleagues uh, had a green thumb. So they were very good at uh, some things. They had the expertise and they was like, oh, really? I didn't expect that from you. Yeah, because I had a grandmother when I was a kid, et cetera, et cetera. So people started to, 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 to know each other as a team uh, even better. So I think that maybe we, we can do more of that, uh, engaging the business in a meaningful way because there are many companies that have uh, either the desire or the responsibility to do more green policy, to support um, sustainable development, uh, etc. But they also have money, so they can contribute to, to these projects. And I know that there was uh, a project in, in Italy when there was a company uh, sponsoring um, the garden in Milano, but in, in return, they were getting um, fruits and vegetables that could be eaten in the office. For example, some uh, uh, strawberries or whatever was um, um, in season. So it was also good for, for, the, for the company and, and a, a weekly reminder to keep investing in this project because uh, there has to be a two-way um, a two-way um, connection um, yeah so we're we're pretty fortunate because we were on private property as I said there's not a lot of green space here all the green space belongs to the high-rise buildings uh, we're on two different uh, locations that have two different uh, landlords and um, the one landlord is super supportive and and gives us funding. Uh, she wants to see us there long term. She sees the value in the community and and how we're impacting it. Um, and the other landlord um, uh, purchased the buildings a couple of years ago, but we've been there for about ten years, and they reluctantly give us funding because they kind of feel the pressure that this is a, a long time tradition. I'm worried that maybe one day they'll be like, no, we don't, we don't want to do this anymore. Um, and I'm also really lucky that I have a private donor um, who has got a little bit of an environmental philanthropy side to him. He's um, a Bitcoin, uh, he's designed some network things. So he's a well off uh, uh, young person who, who, supports us so i feel i'm very lucky in that way when it comes to grants it gets super tricky um here it's kind of easy to get grant money when you're in a public space which we're not um so we don't qualify for a lot of grants um so i'm uh, i'm really grateful that we have donors and then we also do collect um, like on our website and through social media, we will collect donations from the general public. Yeah, well, my experience is that it depends a lot on the people who are responsible and that can be someone in the district. And if you just find one person who is convinced that community gardening is something important and that it is something valuable to the community, then it's much easier to do projects like we had in the third district, we had one person um, who was a district um, representative and he said, well, I really know what you're doing and I really understand. And we had like every year we started a new community garden there for some years. So it was really supportive and it was just, it's not that much money that you need, but you need some funding. And he just realized, okay, it's actually very cheap social work. We're not officially social workers, of course, 
but creating communities, bringing people together, making that people know each other, that people negotiate with each with each other. That's things that cities really need. And he just realized it and was very supportive. And then we have other cases <laughs> where we like fight for two years to start an educational garden in a deprived neighborhood. And it's just complicated because it's like the administrative burdens are so high or the, yeah. And I think in a city like Vienna where everything is very bureaucratic, everything is somehow paternalistic this the city government does for the people not with the people and they're still i think they're still quite afraid of people who are engaging in their neighborhood like they're trying to organize it somehow and always keep it somehow in a <laughs> in a uh, clear frame because like if you do something out of this box it's really complicated and we made this experience for example with our project um on edible cities which, which we did in a new building area in um in vienna and there were a lot of people who were really innovative who wanted to do something and then it was like everything was not possible because it is too dangerous because it doesn't fit in the picture of how the city was designed and for example it's too dangerous to to put up a tiny vineyard because someone could just go through it into um in the dark and somehow cut his head will never happen but <laughs> like and there or or community composting is not possible on public land there because it's not beautiful enough <laughs> it doesn't fit into the aesthetics of the room and then you have other places where it's very easy to do such things so it's very much dependent on the people you're talking with and i think that's a chance at one hand you just have to find the right people but on the other hand it's a big barrier because it's not just like a way you can go wherever you are but it's always kind of a find the right way find the right people find the right donors find the right funding scheme and yeah there's a lot of work going into that and it makes it complicated to get forward but what we also learned that there are a lot of people who really want to change their neighborhoods really want to change their environment and who are really really active in doing that and i think that's also a great thing to be part of those people who want to change something and then automatically you include people you include other people you get in touch with other people i also really like the example of our community composting site here in the 15th district like every time i'm there and we're working at the compost there are other people passing by and saying oh what are you doing here why are you doing that oh what how great you're doing composting when i was a child i also did composting so they're also always linking it like yeah i'm from here and there and we also had a compost there it's really good idea <laughs> and we get a lot of positive feedback as well and i think it ties in really well with your example from earlier about the the small kids that learn about the worm they grow up to be the good kind of bureaucrats and good kind of politicians that understand the value of this you know so you're we're also creating our future partners every time we have an outreach activity this is what gives me hope because i think that change is sometimes very slow uh i am getting so much uh, like a frustration that especially on the administration side it takes so much time to persuade people to find the right people to find at least one people who one person who believes in your idea and he might try to help you make it through in the next three years when his mandate is going to be so uh, there is so much um yeah i don't know uh, so many efforts that in the stars has to uh, align in, uh, um, uh, in a way but this gives me hope that basically we are going to um, the same direction and yes uh, some cities have been smarter or more inclusive or just uh, more forward thinking while others still they, they still need to uh, to catch up and now for example in sofia since uh, the autumn we have new um, mayor new um a city like 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 small mayors because uh, in city I thought we have one but then you have dif different districts so actually one of the uh, deputy chairs of one of the districts is uh, a friend who is an urban gardener and we worked in our garden together we went to Milano together to see some of the best practices and this really gives me hope that, that this person is really pushing through and with the help of his party maybe some bigger changes are are going to happen because now we see the um this looking back at 
uh, oh, when I was a child, I used to have a compost. This is the romantic way uh, to see it. But I'm afraid that uh, at least in our um, uh, uh, environment, what we have heard often is like, no, we move to the city to be better. We don't want to become villagers in the city. So uh, it is seen as something like elevated, that the city is better than the village, which um, for some people might have been a big progress uh, in the future generations um, uh, back in the days to have uh, better conditions like running water, heating, like back in the days. But uh, nowadays the world has changed. So we, 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 um, we need to uh, also, I think, persuade these people uh, that this is really the future. And in this uh, respect, I really appreciate the opportunity for international networking, for international uh, sharing of uh, examples and, and best practices. And personally, I have visited so, my, so many uh, urban gardeners uh, and urban gardens in so many different countries, like in, in Italy, in Belgium, in France, in Netherlands, in South Africa. Uh, for me, it's, it's really very interesting, but I have always been uh, wondering how to communicate this to the policymakers into the local uh, public or the, the local community because this, this uh, really requires effort to start it. Once it's there, it's much easier to join because there is a structure, there are rules, there is something going on. But to actually start it, I think uh, it's it's not uh, really easy and you need a lot of uh, committed uh, volunteers often. <laughs> uh, often they are not paid by anybody, unfortunately. But um, um, this is uh, something and maybe I can share one example that we had um, um, in Sofia because from the very early on when we started to build a garden and to invite different groups, we didn't only want to work with migrants and refugees and Bulgarians, but also to look more in depth into the um, social tissue, if I can say. So, for example, we uh, invited um, people with mental disability or mental health issues, I don't know how to say, um, um, like with Down syndrome and such, uh, maybe I'm not using the correct English. Um, as, so, for example, uh, or some Roma people, um, uh, etc. but uh, from the um, people with the mental issues, they were um, facilitated by uh, one NGO. So they came and they really liked it and they really saw the benefits for their target group. And um, uh, actually next year, they also found a way, I think with some private money, with some public money, and they started their their own garden, which is not so much, um, um, the aim is not so much to engage the local community as a whole, but to be the garden for their own uh, beneficiaries. And they also have a kitchen, they are also doing catering. So they also have this uh, sustainable um, aspect of, the, of this work that they compost and they grow some things. So, but this is really the, the private initiative of one uh, uh, NGO, but I, I'm, I'm a bit frustrated that, that here we still don't see it on a more broader level, like more um, municipal level, that there is no support, no um, like forward thinking, even though that a lot of work ha ha has, 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 has been done in, in, in terms of um, advocacy, research, uh, proposition of ideas, but when the other side is not really into it, you have to keep pushing, pushing, pushing. So uh, my my hope, um, which I'm going to take from this meeting, is that um, we're also going to get to where you are with the, such uh, successful projects also all across the country, etc. So it's going to be uh, more uh, widespread. Thank you. Yeah. But I think like the, the pushing really helps because what, what we can see in Vienna now is that like where there are new building areas and new houses built, the planning already has started to include community gardens. So like almost every new housing area has got a community garden there. And I think that's something that people really want because people say, I want to, I want a green space. I want to show my children how tomatoes grow or how carrots grow. I want to put my hands in the soil. And that's something that after some time and it ta it takes time you have to be in a way you have to be patient and in a way you have all also have to be very impatient and just push and push and push <laughs> but i mean like we've started in 2007 in vienna and in 2007 we had maybe five community gardens and they were not on public land or and now we have more than 200 only in vienna and it's not all our work, but it started with our initiative and it started and, and the few people who were already around with, with community gardens. And then you have to convince step by step and then people, people themselves start pushing for it. And they go to the district mayor and say, we want to have a community garden. How can we do it? And then they come back to us and say, those people want a community garden. Can you support them? Can you help them? 
And so it started growing and growing. And meanwhile, there are many different players dealing with community gardens in the housing associations, in the in public spaces with the neighborhood management. So there are many people engaged. Meanwhile, I took, well, almost 20 years to do so. But yeah, meanwhile, we're we're not where we want to be, but we're much further than we have been like in 2007. You have collected uh, the fruits uh, of your efforts, right? This is also a nice uh, symbolism. And I remember that in the first year of our garden, we also made the, the harvest festival where we invited everybody to eat together, to cook, to have some workshops, to make uh, like all the lectures, like music, all sorts of different activities. But um, this is also the, 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 the nice thing about it. Sometimes you have to really wait for the nature to Mm, to follow the, the 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 nature order but also that uh, if you do things right at the end so there is some fruit we can enjoy together yeah, and i think uh these international discussions and dialogues are very very important uh in my early years as when i was starting to do these projects i did the same as you did Bisra. i i traveled a lot there especially within scandinavia to look at different initiatives and sort of pick out, oh, they they did something smart in how they organized themselves. And, oh, they did something really smart about how they set up uh, the compost. And these ones did something really smart about how they organized a, a board. Uh, and these ones got uh, a lot of media coverage because they did such and such. So I think it's been really, really useful to to see other gardens and how they do things uh they're all of course uh colored by their sort of their context and where they get the funding from and what kind of neighborhood they're in etc um but i think these um these like networking is the way to do it and who knows maybe will all of us write more funding proposals together and be able to visit even to canada that would be great I wouldn't mind a study trip to Toronto. Please, Michelle. Um, I, I want to just comment. There's so much that everybody has said, but I pick up that um, I, I know for a fact there there is a huge disconnect with our society, the way we live as a lifestyle and to the environment. Uh, I see it a lot with like the kids. Sometimes you have the kids in the garden and you say, okay, so where does food come from? And one of the first things that they say is a factory. You know, kids don't know what a tomato plant looks like. And even even our generation, we we lost these skills. So there's a huge disconnect and it's easy uh you know, you said uh, about, you know, we don't live this villager lifestyle anymore, but we are very much a part of a local environment, even in urban settings. And I think community gardens help to bridge that education back in our society. It's important to know that even in our urban settings that we can have uh, connections to the natural world. So, um, and then when it comes to the kids, yeah, the kids will be the ones that will be taking on these roles in the future. This is very important for their, their well-being. You know, we are in a climate crisis. So one of the things that we've been doing because we also struggle with having volunteers. Everybody loves to come to take the harvest. Nobody loves to come to do the hard work. Um, so we, one of our ways to really tackle this is we started a youth program a couple of years ago. So here in, in Ontario, high school students are required to obtain volunteer hours in order to get their high school diplomas, which is great. <laughs> so they have to volunteer. Um, so in my community, as I said, we have a lot of, of students. Um, so we we have a volunteer program, which is a registered program. They have to commit. Um, and we use some of our funding to honor the top five people who commit the most number of hours. So we give them an honorarium for their, their commitment. So it's kind of a prize at the end of the season. And we teach them how, like um, about environmental uh, stewardship, we teach them how to garden. Um, and we're very fortunate enough to have other partners that will come on and host workshops with us to keep it entertaining. So that way we're not just 
getting them to pull weeds, right? Um, we live we live uh, next to a, a green space, which we call the Dawn Valley Ravine. So we've done some hikes through there just to get us out of the garden and to be like, hey, we're connected to a larger part of nature here. Um, we are, my community also unfortunately has a lot of violence, a lot of gang violence that kind of comes with low income communities. So we do have, our police service has these community officers and one of them just happened to be really great at woodworking. So we partnered with them to host woodworking workshops to help engage the youth. Uh, like some of these youth have never operated a drill before. You know, they've never pushed a wheelbarrow before. So they get to have these experiences and they have a lot of fun with that. The other thing we've done to help uh, engage children is we partnered with the schools. So we run a garden club uh, where they come on a bi-weekly basis. We include the parents. So the parents have to come. If your parent is not with you, the kids don't get to participate. So it's a community building and a bonding experience and you get the parent and the child both involved in the garden. And that's some of the ways that we've uh, um, made engagement through our spaces. We've tapped into a similar thing where we, over several years, um, framed community garden activities as youth job programs because it was just a lot easier to get funding for uh, youth jobs. And that way we would have the funding for a mentor to sort of teach them about compost and then they would, that would create sort of the base layer of the volunteers and then volunteers can come on top of that. But then we know that the basic work will get done uh because we have youth doing that and i think that can also be i think it's useful to put that into a bigger context as well uh because we need to talk about what the green jobs of the future are and we need to sort of um come to terms with the fact that the job that we're training teenagers as if they were going into a labor market that looks like what it was 20 years ago but the future is going to be very different you know we won't we you know our cities 20 years from now will not be as they are now so what kind of future should we be, pre be preparing our youth for what we don't know anything about what the future jobs are maybe you know maybe the high status job is to be the local community compost hero uh maybe the you know maybe the the high status job is is to be uh the seed bank of an area we don't we don't know like it sounds wild and crazy now but why not you know uh i also uh, keep when we talk about these things i always also frame like community work and place making to be part of it because uh to build a community where you're happy and content and you have friends and you have a good social life maybe your maybe your neighborhood is so interesting that you don't feel like you need to travel far away during holidays you don't need to fly to a beach in spain uh in july you know because your community is on us also just because community gardens require you to be there in summer you know so you, you can't really just take off and go somewhere else so you have to uh you have to sort of find contentness uh within your community and we can help that happen by creating nice community events like Cordula and I we've been talking about like ways to bring to connect community gardens better to the artistic communities how can we connect arts and culture better how can we open up community gardens to those that do not have an interest in gardening uh, how can we get um, how can it be a public space that that the, the foodies use that the the techies use that you know feels appealing to all walks of life even if you couldn't care less about getting your hands dirty you know when you say that to some people oh it's wonderful to get your hands dirty and some of their some of them you know their eyes start to sparkle it's like yeah getting my hands dirty and but then the 99 percent will say Ugh, do you have gloves for me like oh uh Bistra, how did that work when you had the corporate people working with you did they did they were they all happy about getting dirty or were they not always so happy no <laughs> they they had gloves <laughs> yeah many people, people like, like 
or some were uh, dressed in uh, white, like bright white pants. And like, oh my God, I'm going to get dirty. Yeah, I mean, we wrote it in the invitation. Put your old clothes, made, uh, prepare yourself to be dirty, put your uh, shoes, etc., etc. But yes, I, I, I can completely hear you. And uh, I think this is also really inspiring to, to think about uh, the future and what kind of role urban gardening is going to have uh, really in the future, uh, also in terms of uh, uh, keeping the bees in the cities uh, or some other um, um, urban problems. And um, yeah, in general, also um, finding food for uh, re less privileged people or um, yeah, this is really, really uh, inspiring and nice. Yeah. I mean, that, that was also a key topic of our last networking conference. Like what will communities, community gardens contribute to the future of the cities? And I think it's like, a, yeah, it's a multiple thing because like space in cities is very scarce and using community gardens in different ways, I think will be more, more and more important also to keep community gardens alive. And we we're thinking about using like, I mean, we do already use them as educational spaces, like for environmental education. And we, yeah, we will still think of other ways, like bringing arts in, using it as cool down places and all that. I think my first thought is uh, one community garden per person in a city is not, not realistic at all uh just in terms of, of space uh and we want to have you know it makes sense to have dense cities however i i don't need a personal individual lot but i would i would like to be in network with someone who has access to it uh also because most people are not that interested you know but if they're indirectly connected to it that would also talk to a that will also help our uh, resilience in terms of external shocks, like um, a war situation or an energy crisis or anything like this that is also affecting us. The the self sufficiency in terms of knowing someone that know like I remember during COVID, um, I was really happy that I knew someone that uh, would come to town with eggs every now and then. So I would get like you know two or three trays of eggs and be really happy about that. So I could avoid going to the shop for that. Uh, so net, you know, community networks where everybody knows some someone who knows someone will become really useful. Uh, and the, and the other side of that would be, uh, you know, the farmer can the farmers in the surrounding area of the city can connect closer to the cons consumer. You know, as a small scale cheese maker uh, or a small scale uh, salami producer, whatever that also making agriculture more viable uh, and organic small-scale agriculture rather than the industrial pesticide dependent export oriented uh, agriculture that dominates now so there's there's a great sort of peri-urban urban connection potential that is still untapped into but i think zooming back at your question building networks and building communities bringing people together so that you know someone that person knows someone and that person knows someone and and that's how you get the eggs you know or that's how you get uh you don't have any cabbage in your plot this year because you had a uh, cabbage flies but someone who knows someone who knows someone got some really good ones so we can trade that for that yes uh, networking is makes everything possible maybe if i could just quickly interject before i give everybody else a chance the do you need to have everybody as as a swimmer to have a swimming pool within your community? Answer is no. But you, everybody finds a certain value in it. And I think that's really the key. Uh, Bistra, Kordula, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's what I was talking of before, that community gardens can be very multifunctional spaces. So for one person, it can just be a place where you sit down under a tree and read a book. For another person, it can be a place where you get in, like where, for example, an old person get in touch, gets in touch with children, does something together. It can also just be a place to hang out or a place to get in touch with people, a place to learn a language, of course. Like we had the experience that some people said, well, actually, community garden was the first place where I really 
started talking German because there were other people who were talking German to me. So it can be very, very different things to, to people. And for some, it might just be nice to look over the fence and see some flowers there. So uh, yeah, I think having more community gardens can be very valuable to the whole society, whether they like gardening or not. Of course, you will always have also people who say, well, I want to use this space to walk my dog. I want to use this space to, I don't know, park my car. So of course, we do have those conflicts in the city of, of the use of the space because there is not endless space. But yeah, compared to many other uses, I think community gardens can be very inclusive for all, like for many different ways of using the city and being in a city. I can only second uh, what was said. I have always been amazed with the, the really multifunctionality of the urban gardens, how many things could be done. You can build uh, a skate park around it. You can, uh, yeah, you can do just so many things to uh, engage uh, the local population uh, depending on the region. What I also like a lot is the educational uh, aspect. Could be uh, in schools or in in in, in our, our, um, um, sorry uh, in kindergartens, where uh, kids really get to know and get to learn. They engage their families. It can also be uh, a way to foster family connections and then just in general offer some um, alternative, maybe even healthier uh, in terms of your mental health um, um, way to spend your 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 time is uh, your 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 leisure time instead of, uh, of browsing the phone or watching TikTok videos. Uh, there is the alternative that you can offer as uh, another way uh, to to do things. Because I think that, that, that sometimes people are not so extremely creative. Uh, they go with the flow and they go with whatever they like the most from what is being offered. So once you offer something else, they, they might love it and they would, might uh, find uh, other uh, value uh, in it compared to what you initially had in the beginning. Perhaps maybe some closing words from, from your perspective. What you see is that that idea of the community within the community garden and what that actually means for, for all of you. I'm not sure if it's like the perfect punchline of the final final comment. However, I think one of the things that I try to stress when I talk with community gardens is to try to understand that your 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 audience are not necessarily as into gardening as you are. So we have a tendency, community gardens have a tendency to, to focus their social media on pictures of perfect cabbages and beautiful flowers. And look at this, you know, look at these five amazing potatoes. Uh, and, uh, you know, when we, the word cabbage head, we say that that, that in, in Norwegian means someone who's kind of stupid. So if you're, Talking in in like in terms of cabbage heads, you're not going to reach the ones the 99% that are not already on board. Uh, but if you want to bring people in, you need to showcase like the magic of of interpersonal connections. You need to showcase uh, kids laughing and having a great time, or you know uh, share those stories of uh, of the boy who who was touching a, an earthworm for the first time in his life, or uh, you know, someone who had their first kiss at a bench in, in that community garden or how fantastic that traditional uh, Iranian dish tastes that someone made with herbs partly brought from home and partly grown. And like telling these kind of stories that are not about the vegetables because stories about the vegetables will reach a very, very minute piece, you know, piece of the, of the puzzle of, of the audience. So thinking in terms of experiences and expressions and connections and and emotions uh, when we share our stories to bring more people on board. I think that's what I've learned along the way and, and gotten a little bit better at. I'm still making mistakes, but I, at least that's one of my key learnings that I hope to inspire others to follow. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And what I love most, like the feedback we get when we do, when we facilitate community gardens is, well, I live here for 20 years and I didn't know anyone, but since I'm in the community, community garden, I know my neighbors and I talk to them. And since then, when I go to the supermarket to buy something, I meet three people I talk to, or I at least say hello to, before I didn't talk to anyone on my way to the supermarket. I think those are the really inspiring stories where we see, okay, 
there's something happening with people who are part of this community and one of the community gardeners like once said the whole city become becomes the garden because now like this network of people is spread all over and I, I meet people everywhere i'm connected to people everywhere like knowing people who know people getting in touch with people even finding a job because i've talked to someone in a community garden letting them know that I, i'm looking for a job and then someone else knew oh there's something that fits to you so there's so many things happening and i think that's the really important thing we have to talk about Well, I can only uh, relate to what uh, you said, both of you already. Um, I think that there is also this uh, sense of uh, accomplishment, like uh, we have done this together. Like uh, w as citizens, we were able to gather and to achieve something which we all wanted and now we can enjoy um, the results. I think this also brings uh, a resilience in civil society, especially in um, countries from Eastern Europe where democracy is still not as strong as um, in the West, uh, if I can say uh, like that. And in terms of um, uh, communication, I can only agree. And um, this is also our um, perception of the urban gardening because uh, actually, yes, we had some very, very passionate ur urban gardeners who knew everything about everything. But we as an NGO and organizers, um, for us, the, the garden is only a tool to achieve all of these um, social effects and social uh, results that that you already uh, talked about, and this is also what 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 we have been what we have been communicating. I think that once I had to find a picture of any actual produce, and I only found one pepper, and I said, okay, <laughs> during all these uh, months and months, uh, we were really focusing on. Um, what you said, like the connection between the people, the food and uh, doing this and that, but not so much on the final product in terms of the cabbage or the tomato, or the, um, uh, et cetera. And indeed, um, I think that we live in um, in such an, an area, uh, an era with the uh, social media, uh, uh, et cetera. You might not be a part of this particular garden, but you can still follow it on the social media and you can still part as if you're there every day or, or or every week and you know what's going on there so that's why i think that also a communication is a key to also engage the the unengaged who just uh, like it and they just uh, support it and maybe when it's time to vote for the local elections or whatever or if, if you want to make a big protest because somebody is going to take the space these people could still be on your side maybe not with uh that they have go when they're to to dig or to water the plants but just as uh supporters so um, this is also very good to to plan. I think um, how do you how how do we communicate uh, about these projects to the broader um, audience? 